Genesis, the 32nd chapter, the 22nd verse. Tell your neighbor, I feel so much better. We honor our leader, our founder, our pastor, and the person of Dr. Darius Daniels. Come on, y'all, make some noise for our leader. Our leader, we give God praise for him, his lovely wife and family. There is a word from the Lord. Genesis, the 32nd chapter. I'm going to begin at the 22nd verse down to the 28th verse. When you have it, can you say amen? amen. That night, somebody say that night, <clears throat> Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Two wives, two female servants, 11 sons. Now, I'm not that good at math, but two plus two is four, plus 11 is 15. He had a big squad with him. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Now, you can only imagine how great his possessions were with 15 people to bring with him. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob replied, uh, Jacob answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I want to talk to you today from a simple title, The Signature. Can you say that with me? The Signature. Now do your hand like you're signing a check. Say The Signature. That's spiritual for somebody in this room. You might have caught it. God's about to give you the power to sign some things in your life. And when you sign it, you authenticate it as yours. You know, I, as you know, grew up in a small Pentecostal family-run church. I hailed from the Holiness Pentecostal Church of Christ where you couldn't say the name unless you were holy. I remember sitting in that old school Pentecostal church and when I was growing up, we had something called scripture shower and testimony service. Anybody know about scripture shower and testimony service? If you know about it, just wave your hand. Testimony service was your opportunity to tell people how good God has been to you. And we would open up with a devotion. And after our devotion, we never said devotional. It was only when you got a degree that you learned the word was devotional. For our devotion, we sing songs like, this is the day. Y'all know about it. We got some church goers in the room. And you knew at testimony service that if they never gave you a mic to preach. You could preach during testimony service. In fact, I think that's why they took testimony service out because people told all your business and their business during testimony service. And then we had the option of singing songs. So it was no order. It was the program. Y'all gonna, gonna get excited about that. The program was subject to change by the move of the Holy Ghost. See, you weren't an intellectual when you said Holy Ghost. That was something on the inside, working on the outside. Now that we have our couple degrees, we say Holy Spirit. But when I was coming up, we said the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost has the power to do what you can do. Anybody know about the Holy Ghost? Hey. So during our testimony service, it would just be an arbitrary explosion. And while we're sitting there, Somebody in the room would just get up and bust out in a song like this. Heaven, the 
Don't get too excited. But if you newcomers don't understand why we're still here, even after the fire, it's because we know we've been changed. For those newcomers that need a testimony about how God can bring you out, I may not have a PhD, I may not have an MDiv, but I have a memory of what God has done. When you see me, you see a miracle. When you see me, you see that God is real. When you see me, you see God, because it had to be God for me to be here. They would bust out and sing, I know I've been changed. Some of y'all think you've been changed. But I know I've been changed. Because when they cut me off on the road, I know I've been changed. I don't have no witnesses over there. I know I've been changed because if my last boss said what my current boss tried to say to me yesterday, I know I've been, I, I dare you to look at your neighbor and say, oh, I know I've been changed. There's something about the name of Jesus that can come in and vacate everything that you thought once needed your power and your power signature. Testimony service, I, I long for those days when we knew without a shadow of a doubt that we changed, our conversation changed, our friendships changed. We weren't playing in the middle. We were changed and we changed everything. We leave revival, we delete phone numbers. We leave revival and we would wear white to school every day. We would wear a dress if you were holiness because you wanted people to know that I've been. But my favorite part of that song is that the angels in heaven done signed my name. That means I'm signed, sealed, delivered. I'm sorry, uh, wrong, wrong church. That means I'm signed, I'm sealed, and I'm secure. If that don't make you shout, a house won't make you shout. That means I'm signed, I'm sealed, and I'm secure. That means if I have a good day, he still loves me. That means if I have a bad day, he still loves me. And I'm grateful that he loves me without me having to love him back. Anybody grateful that you're secure? They'd say, that's why I'm safe. I'm safe in his arms. I'm secure and there is an eternal Ziploc bag that covers me when I feel uncovered. You see, I can't lose salvation because the question is not, does he hate me to take it away? When you are secure, the question is, how could you ever have him and want to leave him? When you're secure and you know Jesus for yourself, I'm not talking about having adopted Christianity or Christianity by affiliation. You know, some of us live off the fumes of our mother's prayers. Some of us live off of the prayer life of our grandfather's contributions. But one day when I was lost, Jesus died. I feel like it's an old school church in here. And when you know that you know that you know that you know, if mama don't come to church, I'm still coming to church. If daddy don't come to church, I'm still coming to church. If boo don't come to church, I'm breaking up with you and I'm still going to church. Because you can't love me if you don't love him. I'm interested in that word sign today. Pastor talked to us about transformation this past week. And he lifted up Jacob. I only have time to talk about Jacob. And Jacob's name change was important because when Jacob's name changed, his character changed as well. When you are a female and you get married and you're maiden name changes to your married name changes to your married name you have to go and apply for a new name and everything changes people can't find you on facebook because everything changes because what we see when we see you should be a reflection of the one that you marry in the same way, when our names change, our characters change. When people see us, they should see the Christ that we're in love with. When they don't see Christ, but they see us, I want to know, have you really been changed or did you just join a church? When you think about a name change, you got to know the history of, 
of Jacob because Jacob was a deceiver. He was born in the womb of deception. At the womb, as a twin, he was fighting for first place. Some of us just need to be content with where God has us. Jacob was fighting from the womb to be first, and he was born second. He was a deceiver. And when he grew up and his brother got hungry, he deceived his brother out of his birthright. And when he got a little bit older, his mother enticed Jacob to deceive his father so he could get his older brother's blessing. But I've learned something in life, that what God has for you, it is for you. And when you fight too hard for something, nine times out of ten, it's not for you. Because the Bible says that the way of a transgressor is hard. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It doesn't mean I won't have challenges, but even the challenges will be easy in comparison to the path of transgression. If it's too hard, it might not be God's will for me. If you're trying to fit your foot into a nine shoe and you're a size 12, you're going to end up with bunions and corns and black feet. And some of us are trying to fit into relationships that God never ordained. And we look like a fool walking around in something that don't fit. And we in pain, but we calling it God's will. If it's too complicated, maybe it's your plan, not his. You're trying to make that relationship work. Why won't he love me? Why won't he call me? Why won't he text me? Because his name is not the one that is written next to yours according to heavenly book marriage. He does not order your steps. God orders your steps. Let me tell you, he is, God is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's not the author and the finisher of your fantasy. He will complete what he began, he's not obligated to finish what he didn't start. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He didn't write that book, you did. So he has no need to put happily ever after because you're plagiarizing off of something that he never wrote. That's why he ended it and healed you before it got worse. Aren't you grateful that God did some things before it got worse? Aren't you grateful that God snatched you out before it took you out? Aren't you grateful that God delivered you from the thing you thought you wanted? Because now you're looking like, I wanted that. You see, your partner is not for your present, she's for your future. And if you don't challenge me to be a better future, you don't belong in my present. I know I'm talking to somebody in here tonight, Jacob. He has a resume filled with deception. And then we get to our key text where the Bible says that Jacob has a squad of 15 people. Did y'all read your Bible like I read my Bible? Jacob has a posse of 15 people. Let me break this down for y'all. All of his ace boons are rocking with him when he not in trouble. Jacob has his high school buddies and his college friends showing up at the housewarming party. But when Jacob loses his house, those same friends that used to be there to turn up are nowhere to be found. Jacob has everything that he needs with 15 people and the process goes something like this. He's with his crew. He's having fun. He's with his possessions. He's covered and protected. And then he says, well, things are going pretty good. Y'all go away ahead of me. So they all bounce. Only then. Does he enter a wrestling match with the worst situation that he ever endured in his life before? Some of you are Jacob. Past season, you had so many people to call. In the last season, you had more money than you can count. In fact, you had enough money to give your friends a loan and they still ain't paid you back. 
You had money enough to go and splurge on stuff and you in your closet looking at things that you don't even know that you bought. So you had so much that you could splurge. So you said, let me turn up. And the next chapter, you are at the lowest point of your life financially. Now, if you're anything like me, wouldn't you think, God, why didn't you tell me while I had all this money that I was going to be wrestling by myself here? Can I get any real people in this room? Jacob is having a good time with all these people, and he sends them away and then wrestles with the angel. This wrestling match blesses him. He asks for a blessing, and what he gets in return is a burden. He asks for help, but what he gets in return is a handicap. He asks for a blessing, but what he gets in return is a name change and a limp. Now, this scripture never became more realistic to me than last year when the doctor looked at me and said, you have to have your hip replaced. I said, um, I've been writing dissertations and papers on Jacob and the encounter of worship. I went to Princeton to write about how we can have interdenominational expressions of charismatic worship in a pneumatological context for a liturgical theology. True worship. I did all of that head knowledge, but there's nothing better than experience to teach you what books can't teach you. That's why my grandmother has more power than I'll ever have. Because when she was at her lowest, she got on her knees. She anointed herself with oil. And she said, Father, I stretch. I wish y'all would help me. So I'm writing all these papers. I'm having all these worship services. I think I know what it means to worship until I have to be alone. The year I got diagnosed with this hip issue, I was all alone. Grandparents gone, family and friends gone. Have you ever found yourself alone? Where you turn on the TV to make sure that you're not there by yourself. You are alone. Where you think your phone is broken because nobody is calling you, you are alone. Where you call Verizon and say, did I pay my bill this month? Because you are, y'all not talking about that. I said, Lord, how? Would you allow me to go through this hip season alone when you could have just had me go through that when I had help? Because we trying to tell God the best thing for us when God knows the best thing that we need to have a name change. So I'm, I'm literally getting a hip replaced. I said, which hip is it? They said, the right hip. Jacob had his right hip dislocated. Because it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another thing when it happens to you. That's why I'm the kind of person, if you ain't been through it, don't talk to me about it. Don't pray for my issue if you've never experienced my issue. You don't know what it's like to lose a mother. Don't come over here trying to give me comfort. I want somebody to be real in here that recognizes I've been through something to be a blessing to somebody else. Somebody just shout to God for 30 seconds and give them praise. So I'm wrestling literally all alone for a year just like Jacob wrestled. And the Spirit of God showed me something so so unbelievable. He says, Sean, what you think is a disability is actually my signature. He said, what you feel like is a handicap because I was embarrassed. Every time I walked, I was limping because I was in pain because there is a pain that you can't hide. There is a pain that you can't smile over. There is a pain that tears will bust out of your face before you even know that you're crying. There is a pain, and I'm limping, and I'm limping, and he brought me back to the text. He said, but go and look at how I blessed Jacob. The first thing I did, I dislocated what he was comfortably leaning on. 
in order to bless him, I had to take away from him his dependency on himself. In order to bless him, I had to remove his posse and I had to remove his squad and I had to let him be alone with God so that he can see that after this, the limp says, I've been with God. The limp says, I've wrestled with God. The thing that shows me you're a true worshiper is not how well you can sing. It's not how many books you've read. It's not if you can preach up and down. It's if you got a limp. Because if you got a limp, what I know is you've been with God. Through hell and high water, I've been with God. In the rain, I've been with God. Been through pain, but I've been with God. If you have been with God, I dare you to testify with your praise right here and right now. He wanted me to tell y'all tonight that your limp is not a disability. It's my signature that lets other people know. Because without your limp, they wouldn't stop you to ask you how you got it. Every scar, every pain, every memory, every traumatic experience, God knows how to make you whole and leave the scars so that others can see them and ask, what is that scar there for? He leaves a scar and a limp and an issue so you can testify about the one that you were wrestling with. He leaves the scar so you can tell others about the man called Jesus. He, he leaves a scar as your permanent testimony about a God who can do anything and everything but fail. So where's your scar? Because when you get the revelation that the real blessing is in the burden, then you won't keep asking God to take away what's advancing you. What's your pain? What's your scar? Because now that I've been through it, I'd rather wrestle with God all night than to be around phony people that take God out of my heart. I wish y'all would hear what I'm saying. I'd rather wrestle with God all night than to be around people who you think love you, but they only want what's around you. So I limped and I limped and I limped. And Jacob, as his name was changed to Israel, as his thigh, his hip was removed, the Bible says that he permanently, for the rest of his life, had a signature that says I've been with God. A signature that says he's using me. I went to the bank a couple years ago. I was invited to preach at this wonderful conference. They told me, I'm going to bless you with one of the greatest honorariums that you've ever known. We're going to bless you. You're speaking Thursday and Friday and Saturday three times. I said, wow, that's a lot of speaking. They said, I'm going to bless you. When I got to the hotel, I mean the dorm, there were no sheets on the bed, but they're going to bless me. When I got into the dorm room, there were no towels and no rag, but you're going to bless me. They said, do you want Pizza Hut? I said, Pizza Hut? Don't worry about it. I'm fasting. Then I got my Oreo cookies and I proceeded to eat. So they were boasting about this honorarium, 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 and I'm not a money guy, but I thought, wow, they must be really saving all of this for this honorarium. So after the four days of conference, after they gave me the $95 check and made me pay for the mega bus to get there, y'all didn't hear what I said. Sometimes God uses that as a, as a lesson to see what your motive really is. <laughs> are you preaching for that or are you preaching for his glory? Are you preaching to get paid or are you preaching for souls? Sometimes he's watching in the wilderness to see if you can handle abundance. That was a lot right there. So after I got the $95 check, I mean, it was only one thing to do. Go to the bank and cash that check. I was in Newark, New Jersey at the time, so you know, there were several bulletproof windows in the bank. I got inside the bank, there was a long line. 
I said, man, I don't think this is worth it for this $95 check. But I waited on the Lord. I got to the front after 75 minutes. I had $95 and waited 75 minutes. And I was frustrated, and the lady was standing in the front popping gum. I gave my check. I said, this must not be the day for her. She must have an attitude. Which reminds me, you know, it seems like all the places that you need somebody to be nice, why you got an attitude? Why'd they put you in drive through So, so she's smacking her gum. Just give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. So I gave her, y'all laughing at me. Y'all not laughing with me. I was going to give y'all $10 of it. So I got to the front, and um, she's smacking. I, I can't do this. Whatever. You got to go back to the back of the line. I said, why not? It's nothing wrong with the check. She said, I can't deposit this check. I said, why not? She said, because um, I see the amount on the front, but it's not signed on the back. And if it's not signed, it's not endorsed. And if it's not endorsed, I can't deposit it. No matter how much money is on the front of the check, if there's no signature on the back, I can't deposit it. So you got to go to the back of the line. I said, I'm not getting in the back of the line. I said, can I have a pen? She said, no, we don't have no pens. <laughs> Y'all are laughing at me. Y'all are not laughing with me. I had to go back to the back of the line, ask somebody for a pen, and start all over again. When I signed the check and walked up to the front, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. I said, many will say, I prophesied in your name. I laid hands on the sick in your name. I sang worship songs in your name. I even preached the word of God in your name. But Jesus says, I will look at them and I'll say, depart from me. I never signed you. I never knew you. Oh, sure, I created you, but I don't know you. Oh, no, I'm aware of your name, but I haven't been intimate with you. Because that word no means to be intimate with. So I came to tell you that the signature qualified you to be known by God. The signature qualifies you to be known by God. The signature makes a true worshiper out of you. Now there are many people that are churchgoers, but there's nothing like true worshipers. There are many people that love congregational songs, but there's nothing like a true worshiper. And I want to tell you the difference between a churchgoer and a true worshiper. A true worshiper, it doesn't matter what song is on the screen. Because God is good, my hands are going up. A true worshiper, it doesn't matter who's preaching in the pulpit. If God's word is being proclaimed, I'm going to shout and say amen. A true worshiper will have their best worship experience in private, without a microphone, without an organ, without anybody to cheer them on. Because the Worship is not an outside thing. Worship is an inside thing. Glory to God. Do I have any true worshipers in the room that don't mind telling on yourself for a second? I just came to tell you that your name change is removing from you the spirit of codependency. Never again will you have to depend on anybody else to co-sign for you. Somebody should get excited right there. Never again do you have to ask somebody else, can you pray for me? That's good. But what's even better is when you realize I got the power to pray for myself. I've got the power to speak to the mountain and it will be moved. I've got the power to trust God when I can't trace God. I've got the power to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Pain in my body, but I'll still trust him. Friends are gone, but I'll still trust him. Money is low, but I'll still trust him. I'll trust him through the pain. I'll trust him through the heartache. I'll trust him.
Listen, this is my last point. I want to tell you, you can stand. I want to tell you what the enemy is trying to do in your life and why he's winning on the level of your own worship. When I lived in North Carolina, I had to fly back and forth to New Jersey every week. So I flew back and forth every single week. And one week, they told us that um, there was a lot of turbulence in the plane in the sky. So they delayed our departure. And they were, wa they were waiting for the rain to stop so that we can go up. And I told them in the growth track class just a few moments ago, I said, um, if you ever wanna know if I'm Christian, sit next to me on an airplane. I will speak in Greek and Hebrew tongues. When that plane drops like this, the only word that comes out is Jesus because if the plane goes down, I want my last word to be. Let Jesus come back on a plane. I know I'm going straight to heaven. So, um, so we finally got up after an hour or so and I noticed that the plane was rocking, 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 rocking. The rain, I could feel the rain on the window shield. I said, oh my goodness, this is aggressive. I saw the lightning and the thunder. I said, oh my gosh. And then I saw the, the pilot do something interesting. He went up above the cloud. And what I noticed, Mark, was that it stopped raining above the clouds and when I was thinking about it he told me hey tell Kingdom Church today the enemy wants you to stay beneath the cloud on the level of your turbulence but the goal of worship is to get above the clouds because when you get above the cloud you stop worrying when you get above the cloud you don't even know you're sick when you get above the cloud somebody open your mouth and get above the cloud in this room There is a worship experience that arthritis bows down to. There's a worship experience that your hip condition, your knee condition, cancer forgets that it's in your body when you get above the clouds. So maybe you don't have money for a therapist and maybe you don't want to read one more book, but let me tell you about worship. The best part of our worship is that the refills are free. The best part of our worship is that you qualify for being unqualified. The best thing about worship is that you can go even right now. I dare you to take advantage of true worship and give God an above the cloud experience in this room. Y'all playing with it. I said give God a worship in this room. Listen, somebody here today, you need worship more than you need a promotion. The thing is, you got all this new stuff, but you lost your secret place. And when you lose your secret place, the stuff don't matter. I hear God saying, get back to your secret place where you turned off that phone and you turned that music up and you went completely in because we may not be able to give you hours of worship here, but Jesus is with you wherever you go. So you better activate the power and stop bowing down to the rain. Stop bowing down to the thunder. You have the power to go above the clouds.